Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's not Superman. No, it's the Chrysler Turbine. That's what we're talking about today. Hello and welcome to the Carnard Talks, the automotive channel about all things classic, where today we're going to be talking about the 1963 Chrysler Turbine, which is a really, really interesting car and much like the GM EV1, which you can see here, it met a fate of the scrapyard, but that's not important. What's more important is talking about this absolutely incredible car, and there's only two left in private hands, one of which is with Jay Leno. Don't forget to like and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it, and let's jump straight in. So in the run-up to the war, uh, obviously Chrysler started working on jet engines for aircraft because a lot of the big three were focused on manufacturing military vehicles for the war effort in the late 1930s. And the lead aircraft engineer for Chrysler at the time was a guy called George Hubner. Now George Hubner, after the war, started working in a secret team and they started looking at putting one of these turbine engines, the jet engines, into a car and seeing how that would work. Simultaneously at the same time, Rover back in England were also working on something called the Jet One and GM were working on the Firebird, but it became very apparent very quickly that Chrysler was way ahead of the game when it came to overall automobile feel with one of these Chrysler engines. And they very, very rapidly managed to be able to put one of these into a 1956 Plymouth Belvedere, and it worked incredibly well. Now, there was still problems with fuel uh, consumption, which was very high, but that's not really surprising when you think it's a jet engine. And the other issue was emissions. But that being said, they decided to take it out to their proving grounds in Michigan in 1956 and unveiled the car in front of 500 onlooking press reporters. So in 1956, they put it into another Plymouth and they also started in 1957 filling out patents for the car just so that they could keep the engine production uh, secrets that they had developed to themselves. And in 1959, they put it in another Plymouth and a guy decided to take it from New York to LA, a 3,000 mile journey, and they found out that these cars were incredibly durable. Uh, the reason I say that is there was only two minor issues along the way, and when you bear in mind this is a prototype car, that's pretty impressive. And even more impressive, neither of those prototype issues were actually anything to do with the engine, they were to do with other parts of the car, which you would typically find on a normal combustion engine anyway. So Chrysler were pretty certain that this was something they needed to try out in production and in 1961 they started working on the CR2A which was the final production version of the car which you will see throughout this video. The CR2A was a production version and they were basically trying to work on things like the actual production method, the quality of design and all those different things to get the production cost down because this was an incredibly expensive car to make. One of the other things that they did was also figure in the fuel economy and the emissions. So they managed to get the fuel economy from 13 miles per gallon up to 19 miles per gallon, which is not a lot by today's standards, but when you bear in mind that the average hybrid car from the Americans in the zero zeros was around 25 miles per gallon. So they weren't actually too far off there. They also managed to get the emissions down a certain amount, but production costs were still looming. One of the other main issues that they found is there was an acceleration lag in these cars. But they did manage between the New York to London trip and the production version to get that from 9 seconds of acceleration lag down to 1.5 seconds, which is reasonable enough for driving. After testing a good few different production models, they finally sent it down on one of these cars and they sent it off to Ghia to be produced. Now they had tried it in a lot of other things, including Dodge uh, trucks and, and a few other vehicles that they had across the Chrysler range, a few different Plymouths, Chryslers, and Dodge uh, large vehicles as well. However, they then decided it was time to test this out in the real world and they signed up 75 people who would get the cars free of charge, other than fuel of course, to test these vehicles. Much like GM did with the EV1, which again you can look at here, uh, they decided that they would lease them out at no charge and this way they could take them back and call them experimental vehicles and not have to support them, which they would have under law. The car's design concept was created by a guy in Chrysler Studios called Elwood Engel and that's why it got the nickname the Engelbird. The reason being that Elwood Engel had previously worked for Ford and he was the designer of the famous Ford Thunderbird, ergo Engelbird. However, the car was then shipped off 
design-wise to the famous Ghia Studios who made the Carmen Ghia and a few other incredible cars. And they were the ones who hand-built it. So they hand-built 50 of these between 1963 and 1964, shipped them back to Chrysler, who then fitted the turbine engine, wiring, radio, and that sort of thing, and got the cars prepped for production to be finished, assembled, assembled. Anyway, uh, so instead of the original 75 people that they would hand these to, they would instead hand them to 50. Now the overall looks of this car are fantastic. For example, at the front, you've got kind of chrome, weird looking headlights, a lot of chrome on this car, and it only came in one color, which was kind of a root beer color that was known as turban, turban bronze at the time. At the back, it's got the uh, circular chrome exhausts, which is where the jet engine's uh, emissions come from. And it kind of has that whole jet engine look overall. This was something that was designed in the late 50s, early 60s. And as such, it was designed to look like something that we would think the 90s would look like in the 50s and 60s. And that's essentially what it looks like. And that design kind of continues on into the interior because the interior has something really cool. Its center console looks essentially like the jet engine exhaust is continuing on through the center of the car. Now it's not, it's just a design piece, but it looks quite cool. It also had a lot of switches and dials that resembled something from a jet at the time. But the thing that didn't resemble a jet at the time was actually the circular. It had three circular pods as your speedometer, tachometer, and so on. Um, and these resembled something from the Porsche of the year. You gotta keep in mind that the year this was made uh, by Ghia, the Porsche 911 was just being released. So these are very Porsche-esque designs, considering Volkswagen and Porsche obviously would have been Ghia's biggest uh, contractor at the time. It's not really surprising that they would come up with something like this for the interior. The engine, much like a jet engine, only needed one spark plug to ignite the combustion chamber. Unlike other ones where you have various cylinders, this was just one large uh, chamber. It also didn't need things like radiator fluid, uh, coagulant, anticoagulant, should I say, or antifreeze, or any of those sorts of things. It was a lot easier to maintain than any other car. The car could run on basically anything that would ignite. Um, except for leaded gas. <clears throat> and given this was the 1960s, new forms of cleaner gas, like unleaded gas, were relatively new. So it didn't have that to run on. So you could run it on unleaded gas if you could find it, kerosene, or basically anything that would ignite. And this leads to a kind of hilarious story. And one of the people who got the car was the then president of Mexico, Alfonso Mateo. And Alfonso Mateo decided one night, leaving a party to light his up using nothing more than two bottles of tequila. And he drove his turbine engine home on tequila. Pretty cool. The engine produced 130 brake horsepower, which wasn't too bad for an experimental engine in the the 60s. It would also idle between 18,000 and 22,000 RPM, which is absolutely insane. And it would rev to 60,000 RPM when you were cruising along at 120 miles an hour. The beauty of these engines is the durability of them. They required much less maintenance. They had much fewer problems and they were much easier to repair. The problem was the expense of creating them. One of the other cool things about this car, which you can see on Jay Leno's garage, where he talks about his one, I'll, I'll link this here just to be fair to, to Jay and that is the overall quietness of this engine as well as the stability of it so by that I mean it doesn't vibrate like another engine does in a, in a normal combustion engine you've got pistons obviously flying back and forth or side to side in a boxer in this you just have one circular motor just turning and turning and turning so it doesn't vibrate anywhere near as much as a standard uh, combustion engine car does and because of that, essentially you can rest a glass of water on it and it will not vibrate whatsoever. This thing is incredible and I really, really wish they had continued on working on these. But given we're moving into electric car now, I think it would be past the point of necessary. So as I said, they produced 50 of these and they started their program with their test users between 1963 and 1966, where they lent out 50 of these cars to various people. I believe it was 150 in total finally got the cars, but they recycled the 50. So the people would get them at no cost for three months other than having to fuel themselves. 
and they got to test the cars. However, what they found was some problems. One was the production costs, obviously, but Chrysler figured they could probably get that down. But there was also some engineering challenges that went along with this. For example, there was an eight step starting procedure, which a lot of the people found difficult and ended up causing engine damage. Another thing was that if you were living in a place at high altitude, imagine you're in the Colorado Rockies or somewhere like that, the starter uh, would malfunction in those situations. So there's a few of those different issues and inevitably Chrysler decided not to keep the car going. So they brought them all back in and did what GM did. They gave most of them to museums and they actually just crushed the rest, which is really, really sad when you think about it. Two of them um, did end up in uh, private hands. I can't remember the other guy, but as I've mentioned, Jay Leno had one. And of course, the other seven, I believe it's seven that were kept over, were put to various museums. I think the Smithsonian is one of those museums, but it's a really, really cool car. Um, so if you have any information or if I've said anything wrong about this car, as I often do in my my reports like this, because uh, you know the internet is not always the most reliable source of information, please tell me in the comments. I'd love to learn more about this, or if you've driven one, Maybe your father had one for that three months. I would love to hear from you in the comments or comment on Drive Tribe if you're reading on there. Um, but a really, really interesting car, really, really interesting experiment. And it's sad we don't really see these things happen anymore. Um, so that's it for today's show. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about, I believe, the Volvo P1800. Then we have another interesting three-wheel car next week. Um, next week is a lot of videos and also I have done a review with a Suburban, but the view was really, really badly done. So I'm gonna turn that into a more humorous kind of, this is what happens when you try and impersonate Doug Demuro type video. Um, but I'd like to kind of keep my videos to this here. Uh, launching something very, very soon as well. It's kind of under the nose, but uh, we're going to have a car show coming with some of the people from Drive Tribe, which is going to be really great. So thank you so much for joining me today. And don't forget to like and subscribe. I'd really, really appreciate it. Thank you.